So this is the practice exam. Um, hopefully you've had time to look over it. Uh, it is deliberately both harder and longer than the actual exam. Um, in fact, part of what I was doing last night before I was interrupted by a toddler with a fever uh, was, so uh, by the way, that also means I'm gonna do, I am gonna try to get home uh, as quick as possible after, the, after this lecture. I should be in here for office hours. Um, oh, speaking of office hours, I think what next week is Yom. I think next Wednesday is Yom Kippur. Um, right, today is Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year's. Uh, a lot of people don't. Sometimes uh, I decided though that because I wasn't here yesterday, it was fine for me to be in here today. Let's just go ahead and see. Uh, yeah, so Wednesday I am going to be out of. Next Wednesday, I'm going to be out. So to make it up for you, I'll probably hold my office hours on Monday, as from 12 to 3 on Monday or Friday, depending, so that you guys will still have office hours that week. It just may not, it just may be during a different day because I won't be in during Wednesday. And in fact, I'll be completely incommunicado that day. Okay, so just FYI. Um, also, as I meant, I was, co I was covering um, for Kat's lecture this morning. A um, couple things to note. First off, um, part of the reason we do these exams early on and the like is, yes, I still have to do the grade, a grade one of the quizzes that we've done. Um, part of why I try to do this is that when, when it, is that like I get asked to send out early alerts for students soon, like, you know, satisfactory, unsatisfactory, which have no bearing on basically your, your academic record whatsoever. What they do uh, serve as are, are early warnings. So basically, if we need to try to intervene because you are not really doing well in class, they give you a heads up. I tend to be aggressive on those in the sense that I will give students who have I, I, students who end up getting a B often it, it's not it's it's entirely possible they get they got an unsatisfactory uh, in the midterm report because I am super aggressive I'll say because I'll have I'm not going to look at whether or not you're passing the class I'm going to look at like each individual section are you passing like okay did you do did you pass the exam did you do most of the quizzes are you up to date on your homework not only have you turned it in but have you demoed those homeworks. Right, those kind of things. So if you see that, and it also lets me to say, oh, have you been to, you know, so it allows me to give, give a lot of detail, a relative amount of detail um, as to what the early alert is for. So if you get those, it's just simply saying, I think there, there is something troubling here that you need to address. It may or may not, it may be a minor thing, it may be a major thing. And that's the easiest way. Yes? Um, for the cheat sheet on the exam, is this like That's fine. We're not, yeah, I'm not very, I'm not very, yeah, just don't bring in a giant poster board. It's the, that's why we have a size restriction, right? That's, don't, you know, you know, um, all right. So uh, practice exam, well, yeah, there was, so the actual exam will be out of 105 points, so five extra points of extra credit slash curve already built into it. Um, so, um, the amount of points roughly d correspond to the difficulty of the question, not the amount of space. The amount of space is just simply for uh, my formatting of the exam. So just because you've got a full page, but it's worth five points, doesn't mean that you're going to use up the whole page. It may, like one of the, it may think that I, that basically that I, it may just be like one thing or, an, or another. That, that, right, I might just think that, oh, I, it's, it may just be that that, that page needed to be, it couldn't really be added to the page before or the eight page after it, right? That, that's part of the reason. I try to give you guys plenty of space. Um, and you can ask for clarification during the exam and I'll be more than happy to give you that kind of uh, clarification. Also, if you have something really clever, you, there's additional extra credit available. Like if you do something, if you manage to do something really clever on the exam, you can earn extra points that way. So, okay. This first page is going to be very similar on the actual exam, which is that uh, this will all tie back to both the very first lecture and the very first um, and the very first homework you did. So be sure to you know, review your very first homework, um, the Hello World one. So 
Um, and it's also going to be worth more than four points. I up the uh, I up the amount of points it is on the actual exam. So true or false? The computer science is the study of computers. False. Right. What is it the study of? Thank you. Algorithms. That is the answer that will give you full credit on, on that. So computer science is the study of algorithms. Uh, Alan Turing is considered to be often considered to be the first programmer. Okay. Who is? Uh, Ada Lovelace. Yeah. Ada Lovelace, okay, uh, which goes in to say who is she, which, who is she and why is she an important figure because she was, she's often considered to be the first programmer. Uh, who are some other, what are some other historical for, uh, figures we, so what was Alan Turing known for since he's one of the other, he's like part of the three that I cover? Cracking the enigma as well as, as, as doing what? Yes. No, he did not create Python. Uh, that was uh, Guido, I think. Yes. That's part of the enigma. He formalized the, uh, he came up with the formalized uh, mathematical model of a computer called the Turing machine. He's also well known for creating something called the Turing test, which is basically can we, Basically, which is basically uh, a kind of test to basically say, is this, is this a person or not? Or rather like an experimental kind of test. Um, the other person we went over was Mohammed Ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, if I've, and I probably butchered that name. And what is he known for? Yet we get the name algorithms from his name. Uh, he was known for, he created the first book on algebra. In fact, he, we get the name algebra from his book, Algebra. Um, so most importantly, just again, briefly, briefly, briefly review, the, review those figures and briefly, briefly, briefly review the first homework you did. Not a lot of time. If, if, you, spend more, if you spend more than 10 minutes on uh, reviewing for this page, then that's too much. But if you spend less than five minutes, it's probably too little. That should, I think that's a fair amount of time that I've, that I've shown, that, that I gave you. All right, this page gonna be pretty much this, so it's gonna be pretty much the same, but slightly different, okay? Uh, this page, what we're gonna do for this page on the actual exam is rather than having 10 questions, because uh, you know, I'm trying, I'm, right now I'm going through and shrinking the exam for time constraints and adjusting points and stuff, removing points, uh, questions that I feel like uh, are duplicates or basically test you on a lot of the same stuff, I will shrink, instead you're gonna have five of these questions as opposed to 10 on the actual exam. Furthermore, on this page, I'm gonna go ahead and just take these and move them, uh, this is gonna go from five questions to three questions and they're gonna get moved to this page as well. So this page will be all about expressions. So we're gonna go ahead and go over these expressions though. Um, so, two times three divided by six times 100. Now one of the big things to note here is that order of the way order of operations works in Python is that it's left to right it's, um, for multiplication and division, right? You don't do division first or multiplication first. You don't say, oh, if the multiplications were on the right, you do them first. This is just simply left to right here because they're the same tier. Uh, but division operations and multiplication operations become before addition operations. So two times three is six. Divide, divide six, that means we do integer division. So six divided by six is one, right? The math is super easy, I try to make the math super easy here. Six divided by six is one, one times anything is that thing, so their answer is 100. One mod two plus three mod two. So what is the remainder after one is divided by two? One, three after divide, being divided by two. One, so it's one plus one, so it's two. Again, trying to be really easy here. Negative one plus negative ten and a half, not a trick question. It is, it is, 11, it is negative eleven and a half, right? Remember that it's a float and that the integer will get converted into a float. So we're not gonna chop off the point five. We are going to add a point zero. Anytime there's a binary operation, of any kind between an integer and a float, the integer gets converted to a float. Okay? This one's checking order of operations, right? 
First thing we do is not is not four plus three, but th sorry, four plus five, but three times two. This becomes six. So it's four plus five minus six. So four plus five, nine minus six, three. All right. Again, this is when you see big scary numbers, generally that means I'm just I'm just messing with you. Okay? Zero times big scary numbers in parentheses is zero. Minus 1.0 means this is negative 1.0. Okay, makes sense to everybody? Okay, order of operations, right? You don't have to add that up. You're multiplying by zero. Your computer probably even has a little bit in their chips that says, oh, if I'm multiplying by zero, don't bother just trying to do it. I'm just going to speed through it. Two times Four, uh, 2 times 4 minus 20. Remember, we're doing the 2 times 4 first, so this would be 8 minus 20, so negative 12. Right? If you need a four-function calculator for this, then it is not necessary. Then, or if you feel like you need a four-function calculator for any particular one of these problems, then you're probably overanalyzing it. Right? 7 divided by 3. 7 divided by 3. So, right, if it was just... If this was just plain division, this would be an, a mess, right? It would be, what, 2 and something, like 2.33333. But this is integer division. So how many times can 3 go into, two, into 7? Two. 2 times plus, and then we have this bit over here, 2 times 3. So this is 2 plus 6. So it's 8. 4 mod 2 times 3. What is 4 mod 2? Zero. 0. 4 mod 2 is 0. 4 mod 2 is 0 because 4 divided by 2 gives us a remainder of 0 multiplied by anything that gives us 0. The reason why, why mathematicians, uh, why, why your math professors and physics professors love having 0, 1, or 1 half as an answer is the same reason I love having those as answers because it makes it easy to grade. Okay. Um, what about big number divided by really big number? 0. zero. It's integer division, so it's one, any any number you can test it out in Python yourself. Anytime we have some big number divided by anything that's got more digits, well, that's floating division, but integer division we're going to get zero. All right, so uh, ten times times two times two. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Is it 200 or is it going to be 10 to the fourth? And the answer is order of operation still applies. And we don't put parentheses around this. X, right? PEMDAS. Parentheses, what's that E? Yep, 10 times, so 10 to the fourth power is 100. Times 2 is, yep, 200. So. Right, this is one of those where I'm not actually going to ask you something like that on the exam. That's just kind of just trying to emphasize here that it is the same PEMDAS you already know and hate. Or love, I forget. Um, all right, doesn't like those stars, so, right, because they're like different type. 200. Yeah, PDFs are weird, so sometimes copying and pasting from a PDF doesn't really work out that well. All right, so a lot of these are just, again, I'm messing with you here. Um, I'm not going to mess with you nearly as much on the actual exam. Um, some of these are just to re-emphasize the point and hammer it home like crazy, okay? So true or something else. If you have a true on the left and anything else on the right, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be true no matter what. Right, it's true, this goes, becomes true or false, which becomes true. Not false. True. Right? That flips what that is. So not this thing and 3 less than 10. 3 less than 10 is easier, so I'm going to do that first, even though I should do that one in the parentheses first. But that is true. And then we've got 4 is less than 2, which is false. Not false, we've already established is what? True. So true and true gives us true. Right? For an and statement, both sides have to be true. If both sides are false, it's going to be false. If one side is false, it's going to be false. Now, this one is definitely me messing with you. Uh, so 3 divide divide 8, that gives us 4. 
32 divided by 8 gives us 4.0. So now the question is, is 4 equal equal 4.0? So it is yes, and the re here's the reason. Um, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about this. Anytime we have a binary operation between an integer and a float, the integer will get converted for the float, and that's true for when we're doing comparisons like this as well. Right? Because we'd expect, and the reason is, is that we expect, again, this isn't something you would have gone over, if you got that wrong, no worries, because this is literally just to reemphasize this point, right? We expect this to work, right? So we would also expect uh, this to work as well as this, right? And the only reason that's gonna, way that's going to work is if we convert. That's why that one works. Okay, this one is definitely harder than what's on the exam, and again, what we would do here is just simply cross things off. Um, I guess I'll do it here. Well, actually, no. I'm not going to bother writing it that down. I'm just going to select it. So let's see. Uh, true or true or false becomes true, and not true becomes false. So this becomes false, right? Cross this all out, replace it with false. This becomes true. Cross it all out, becomes true. So we, now we have true and false inside the parentheses, right? That is going to be equal to false. Now that's inside another set of parentheses fault that, that's preceded by a not. So that, becomes, so that false becomes true. So the answer for all these, in case you couldn't follow, was true, 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 true. So that should also tell you, let you know that I am totally uh, a troll when it comes to my, uh, to, it comes to my exams. So um, I won't necessarily, so if, so if there does seem to be an even, uneven distribution of things, it's not necessarily because you're wrong. Um, so. So the next two questions, you can assume x and y already exist. Write an if statement that checks if x is a multiple of y. And really all we care about is the if part of it, not any part that comes under it. So, um, so in other words, we're looking for if x is a multiple of y. That mean, For it to be a multiple of y, it has to be divisible by y, which means that if we divide it by y, it has to be a remainder of 0. So if x mod y equal equals 0. That had a bit more mathematical thinking than I would like on the exam, but makes sense. And that's really all I'm looking for for that one. All right, this one's a pretty nasty one, but I like it anyway. Uh, write an if statement that, and nasty I just simply mean it's a bit longer than, uh, a bit longer than you, I would like people to write out, but the easiest way. Write an if statement that checks if either x or y is even and the other one is odd. So, all right, so if x, so we have to check if x is even and the other one is odd. So there's two possibilities there. x is even, y is odd, or x is odd and y is even. So that's what we have to check for. So let's write the first one, if x is even and y is odd. How do I say if y is odd? There's two ways. Not equal to 0, right? If we divide y by 2 and we don't get a 0, that means it's not evenly divisible. Or we can just simply say if, it's, if we divide and it's equal to 1. So that's both ways are perfectly valid. And I'm going to put this in parentheses because I don't bother remembering the order of operations between the ands and ors, and neither should you. That's, I'm, that's a lot already, right? Instead, be explicit about what you'd like for your order of operations with ands and ors, right? If this is true, or if x is odd, and I like to put spaces in just simply because, or, sorry, and, y 
divide by 2 equal equals 1 with a 0. So if x is odd and y is even. That's really all, again, all I care about is that if statement. So we've got two clause. x is divisible by 2, y is not, or x isn't divisible by 2, but y is. Hmm. By the way, you guys, get anybody, anyone go to the football game on, on Saturday? No? I was there. I actually graduated from Georgia Tech, so, so, and man, let me just tell you, Atlanta teams, they never disappoint to disappoint. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I say that as basically someone who has, you know, watched a lot of football teams in Atlanta. So, so, what is the, so now we get into the is state, um, the iterative statements. I probably am tossing most of these, th these kind of questions on the exam, but for knowing how the if statements work and the divisibility, that stuff's important. Um, similarly, for these questions, I'm probably going to take less of these and do more of turtle type uh, questions where I give you the code and ask you to analyze what the turtle, and draw what the turtle does. Okay, so what is the output of this code? For I am range 10, right, so I'm going to grab this. I'm not going to run it. I'm just going to copy this so that I can have something to work with while we're. So for I am range 10, if I mod 1 is equal to, if I mod 3 is equal to 1, print I. So that's a bit different than what we normally see. Again, this is one of the things where I am totally trolling you as a professor, because normally what you see is this. If I mod th uh, 3 is if it's divisible by 3. I'm not asking if it's divisible by 3. I'm asking if you divide it by 3, is there a remainder of 1? That's what I'm asking there. So I'm asking for the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right? So first off, if this if statement wasn't there, that would be my answer, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But this if statement is there. Oh, and all clumped together as one word because of this little end, which remember says this is how I want to end the line. Normally I end a line by moving on or end a print statement by moving on to the next line. Here I'm saying with an end statement, then I'm ending the if statement, by the, the print statement by doing nothing. So when you print again, it's going to resume in the exact same place. By default, it's moved to the next line. So if you leave it out, it's going to go to the next line. All right, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So let's go through this. Uh, so if, so is 0 mod 3 equal equal to 1? So 0 divided by 3, that gives me, that's, that's zero remainder zero. It's not remainder one, so we're not going to print anything out. What about one? One divided by three gives us one gives us zero remainder one. Doesn't three does not go into one any times, right? You cannot subtract. Um, you cannot subtract three f from one and get another natural number. Natural number, right? That those are your numbers that are your counted numbers. Okay. So three so zero remainder one, so we're going to print out one. We're going to keep our one. Okay, what about two? Two mod three, zero remainder two. We're not going to print that out. What about three? Three is divisible by three, so it's going to be remainder zero. Not going to print it out. Four. Four mod three, that's, gonna, that's going to give us one remainder one. So we print out the one. It was the four. Five is one is one remainder two, right? Five minus three, we can do that once, and then we'll get two left over. So, nope. Six, also divisible, so that goes back to zero. Seven is one. Seven mod three, you can subtract three twice from it. So quotient is two, remainder one. So it becomes 1, 4, 7. 8 and 9, right, this is remainder 2, remainder 0. So that's why our answer is 1, 4, 7. By the way, it's a string. You don't have to put the, string the, the strings after it.
but it's 147 as opposed to 147. Okay, next, convert the following uh, while loop to a for loop. There's going to be less of the while loop conversions on the exam because we didn't go too much into detail about the while loops, but also because I was a bit lazy in, in modifying my, uh, my exam here. But really what we want to do is read this while loop and write a for loop that does the equivalent, which is to say, what does this while loop do then? Well, it starts with i is equal to 2, and while i is greater than 0, it will print, will print out a bang. So i less than or equal to, so now then we decrement 1. So i's value is 2. Let's write it on the board. i is equal to 2. Is 2 greater than 0? Yes, it is. So we print out an exclamation point, and then we subtract 1 from i. Okay, i, is it currently greater than zero? Yes, it is. Print out a bang. And then we subtract one from it. Zero, is zero greater than zero? No, it is not, so we don't do anything, so we print out two bangs. So the equivalent for loop where we're moving, where we're subtract, where we're starting, the equivalent for loop, if we want to do it twice, well, let me print it up on the board. It's for i in range, but well, we could do i in range 2 to do it twice, <coughs> Give me one second. and then print out exclamation point. But if we wanted to go, if we want to go down, we'd say let's start at 2, go down to 0, and go by negative 1s in the fourth. Right? Go start at 2, begin at 2, end at 0, but don't include it and go down by this, and go by this step, right? Right, just to refresh her on, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the range, on the range statement. List range, right? If I give it one argument, it's gonna go zero up to, but not include that amount. If I give it two arguments, it's, this first number specifies where we're gonna start, include, and it includes that starting point and it's going to up, still go up to but not include the last point. So here, five up to but not including 10. And what's cool is that you can take the end, subtract the start, and you're gonna know how, long, how many items you have. 10 minus five, we got five items over here. If on the other hand we add a third argument, this is the step, meaning we wanna go from five up to 10 by twos. Now, if we do negative 1 over here, uh, we get nothing because there's no way to go backwards from 5 to 9. But if, on the other hand, we say we want to start at 20 and go down to 10 and end at 10 by negative 1s, we will. And the same applies here. 20 minus 10, there's 10 values here from 20 to 11. So remember, you can use range, you can subtract with range as well. Okay. So what's wrong with this loop? Question for the previous one. Probably, probably. I'm not, uh, because I didn't really specify how to convert it into the for loop. Did it have to be exact or did it have the same functionality? So I would probably, I'd count it as correct. All right, so for this question, what's wrong with this loop? Yes? So that would be an infinite loop, and then that would just go on forever? Yep, yep, you cannot, yep, you, it's an infinite loop. It's gonna go on forever. This will never end. The statement will never end. It will, no, will not even crash. It's just gonna go on forever because this just never, this condition never changes. I is always less than 10. It's going to print zeros forever. Um, you could also argue, no, nothing is wrong with this loop. I want it to print zeros forever. But, but acknowledge that basically that the, the function here is that you want to print, it's going to be printing zeros forever. And this is probably an undesirable behavior. Yes, in the back. Um, so that 
Yep, it would print threes forever. It wouldn't work for 11s, though, because then it would never run, right? The, this, this, uh, if i is equal to 11, while 11 is less than 10, that would never want. On the other hand, negative 11 would work perfectly fine. It would print negative 11 forever, right? So long as the, the big thing about the while loops is that, they, is that you, have to, you have to control how they get iterated through. Yes? Yeah, so when you were saying about the i is less than 10 is equal to 11, it wouldn't go, but if it's i greater than 10, and then you put 11 as i is equal to 11, would that? Yes, so long as the condition is true, and it will run. Yeah. And if you never change the condition, it will always remain, sorry, and if you never change either part of the condition, it will always run, it will run forever. Right. Typically, the way th typically this happens because you forgot to put i plus equals one or something like that, or to change or to forgot to increment i. All right. So, this is the question that's this question is much 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 harder than what would actually be on the exam, but it's also very similar to what I'm. Uh, it's similar to the kind of things that I like to put on the exam. So, if you can mas master this question then you have no worries about the actual exam. If you're still having trouble with it, I wouldn't panic, but I would just know to study more. This is kind of where you want, and it, I put a hint in the footnote, in the footnote, footnote, jeez. All right, um, and you'll notice that at the end of the exam, I, often, I also have a number of just practice questions that are similar to this one, subtly similar. or subtly different, rather. All right, so we want to write a nested for loop that prints out this pattern. So let's go ahead and go to our editor. And here, I will actually make use of this. Now, again, We don't have a compile. We don't have an interpreter to use with us on the exam, so I really shouldn't make use of that, and I'm not gonna. But I want a nested for loop that's going to print out this pattern. And there's pretty much no way to do it other than to use a nested for loop. Okay. So, question is, what do I need right here? We need to do a for loop that prints out five lines of stuff, right? Now the key is to understand when I write something what I'm going to write, be writing. For i in range, <coughs> 5. I'm not going to use i though. That's a terrible variable. I wouldn't know what i is. I'm going to use line instead. Right? I'm going to use line instead. Now, if I were to just print out line, it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, what I really want to print out is the first value is I want it to be, let's just figure out printing out the very first value at each line. It's a bit tricky, but we can make that work. So if I wanted to print out the very first value, which I'm gonna, by the way, there's gonna go through a lot of erasures, so don't like madly scramble for this part. This is just simply to demonstrate the, the concept we need. So 10, 8, 6, 2, uh, 6, 4, 2. So this change, this what print gets printed at the beginning changes. The only thing that I have that changes in this for loop is line. So that's what we're going to have to use. So each line starts from 10. We can think of this as 10 minus 0, 10 minus 1, sorry, 10 minus 2, 10 minus 4, 10 minus 6, 10 minus 8. We're subtracting something. So if I were to print Line, if I were to print 10 minus line, that wouldn't get me the first line, the first bit of each line. That would give me 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And I'm just going to print it out, not because I need to test it, because uh, I want you to see that I know what I'm doing, that, that basically I know what I'm doing here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Why? Because line is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Line is, and I find making tables like this generally is very helpful, right? Line is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? 
And then we know that um, that the the start of each line, right? We would like that to be ten. 8, 6, 4, and 2. So, how do we get from here to here? Well, what we can do is that we can use an equation. We can say, hey, subtracting line doesn't work. We need to do line times 2 to subtract. And that's going to be our starting point. OK. So now I need to think about subtracting each of these. So now that I've got that, now I need to work on subtracting each number. Now this is the starting point, which is useful because the range has a start function. So for val in range, and we're going to start here. Right, so we'll start the value at 10, this line at 10, we'll start this line at 8, this at 6, this at 4, this at 2. Right, this will produce, on line 0, this will give us 10. On line 1, this will give us 8. 10 minus line times 2. It'll be 2 will give us 6, 3 will give us 4, 4 will give us 2. So we want to go this way down. We want to go down to 0 but not include it. And we'd like to go down on each row, we'd like to be going down by twos as well. 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, 8, 6, 4, 2, 6, 4, 2, 4, 2, 2. So we're going to go down by two, so that, again, I'm going to necessitate printing negative two there. So for each line, what are we doing? For each line, we are going to go through all the values in this range and print them out. And we'll go ahead and say, I'd like them to be ended with a space. And then we go to the next line. Now there's a number of ways to do this. And I wouldn't say that any was more correct than the other. But there are a number of correct ways to do this. And so long as it works, it works. But the idea is like breaking it apart. OK, here's the starting point. OK, for each starting point, I have to co count down by two for that line. right? The way to view these problems is like, for each line, I need to do a bunch of stuff. OK. For, and now I'm just focusing laser focus on that line. What do I, on a specific line, what do I have to do for this line? Oh, I have to print out all the values from the starting point down to two. Don't view it as like, yeah, the problems are intertwined, but if you try to view everything as like, uh, from, from beginning to end as being completely intertwined, you're going to go mad. Nobody just spits out this code like this. They, they break it down into small component pieces and put it together. Similarly for the next question. Nobody just looks at that and immediately goes, oh, I know what the answer is. I mean, I do, but because I wrote the darn exam. That's the only reason. <laughs> if you were to actually a ask me something, uh, a hand me this, or any other computer scientist out there, to ask them what the answer was, their reply is going to be, hang on, I'm going to grab a piece of paper. They're not going to try to do it in their head. It's too much. So. <coughs> What is the output of this loop over here? <coughs> so for this one, okay, we are going to close this terminal because it keeps getting in the way. For this one, not so bad. Indent, indent, indent. There we go. All right, so for I am range, there's no need to so for I in range 3, 
for j in range i plus 1. So here what we've got to do is keep track of the values of i and j as we go through them and what we have output. So for i in range 3, so i is going to start out as, as 0, right? So for j in range i plus 1. So j's value is going to be over the range of so when i is 0, this is important because what the range is, is going to change each time we go through the loop. Each time we go through the loop, it's independent. right? The loop doesn't maintain any memory of the times it's been through the loop before. So i is in range 3, i is 0. j in range uh, i plus 1, that's 1. So j's value is going to be z uh, 0 from 0 up to and not including 1, so only one value. So now we print out i plus j. What is i plus j? 0. Plus 0 is equal to 0. Then we are done with this inner loop, so we print out, so we print to the next line. Then we go to i is equal to 1. So now we go i is equal to 1. j's range is going to be equal to, um, what, 0. So it's going to be equal to i plus 1. So what is i? Right, so i plus 1 is 2. So j's values are going to be 0 and 1, two total values. So now we're inside this loop. What is i plus j? What is i plus j over here? One. one. I and j are one. So now we go to the next, so we just finished with i is equal to zero. So j is equal to zero, so we're going to move j up to one. What is i plus j? Zero. Right? So now we're done over here with, because we've gone over two values. Right? We've done zero and we've done one. We've gone up to but not included two. So we're done there. Move on to the next line. Next thing we got to do for is we update i. i goes up to but doesn't include 3, so this is our last value for i. j is going to be start at 0 and go up to but not include i plus 1, which is 3. So there's going to be three values for i, which means this print statement is going to execute three times. So it is 2 plus 0, then we move up to 1. 2 plus 1, and then 2 plus 2. Right. So it's not 0, 12, 2, 34. It is 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. The, question, the equivalent question you'll have on the exam is a bit easier than this, especially since I won't have you keep track, I won't need you to keep track of the numerical values of i and j like that. But if you, again, if you can focus on these two, I'd focus on these two questions if you're having trouble. All right. So, ne so the next couple questions are stuff that I'll definitely uh, have in the exam, um, something like that. So programming, what are the values of x, y, and z after the following statements, right? x is equal to 7, y is equal to 8, z is equal to negative 5, right? And again, it's very hard to keep track of these things in your head, so I suggest not doing that. <coughs> so, got x, y, z, okay? So first, x is equal to x plus 1, which means that x is now equal to 8. y is equal to x plus y plus z. So x plus y plus z is 8 plus 8, which is 16, minus 5, which is 11. So y's value is now equal to 11. And z is equal to z plus equals 1. So that means we add 1 to z's current value, which means that z becomes negative 4, right? Adding 1. It's supposed to negative 6, which is an understandable. If 
you did the negative six, that would have been a minus one point on this question because that's an understandable math mistake, not a logic mistake. <coughs> you understand what the plus equals mean, you just forgot about negatives. All right, what is the value of a noise when 5342 is called? Right, and then I just tell you to try some other ones after that. So annoy. So five, three, four, two. Now remember, when we pass in numbers like this, it's all about positions. So the five becomes A, the three becomes B, the four is C, and two is D. So five, three, four, two. So if five is greater than three, and five is less than or equal to four, that's not true, so we go on to the next one. Now, this is actually an error. I had it from, because I converted this from a, from a Java program, it should be elif. Else if two is greater than, two, if two is greater than four, or two is less than three. So that's true, so the output for this one is gonna be green. Right, the easiest thing you can go to, it go do is to go through this one, is basically scratch off the all the A's, replace them with fives. Scratch off all the threes and replace them with B's, right? Or B's and replace them with threes. Sorry, it's fine. So two, three, four, five. A is greater than A is greater than B. Um, that would be fal false, so we don't even have to bother checking this, uh, this other part of the statement because of what we call short-circuiting. Basically, if one part of the AND is true, we aren't even going to bother checking the other part of the AND. Oh, sorry, one part of the AND is false. We're not even going to bother checking the other thing because that's not going to change the outcome. So if D is greater than C, uh, 5 is greater than 4, we don't need to check any th the other part because we know 5 greater than 4 or whatever else, that's going to be true. So we're going to print out green as well. All right, this one's fun. What, what is the output of the following program? Foo prints foo, bar, bar calls foo, prints bar calls baz. This is one of those deliberately annoying intro to programming uh, questions that you're expected to be able to, de uh, to deal with. And Boz prints Boz but calls foo. All right, then we call foo, bar, and Boz. All right, so for this one, let's go through this. Uh, foo, we call foo first, which just simply prints foo. Okay. The next thing we do is that we call bar. Now bar calls foo, what does foo do? Foo prints foo. <coughs> bar then prints bar. <coughs> and then it calls boz. Boz prints boz. And then it calls foo. Calling foo prints foo. So we're done with boz, which means we're done with bar. So now we do ba boz again down here, which will print another boz and another foo. So that's your answer. Now, interesting question over here. Now let's change boz above so that it goes foo bar, what would happen? Would infinite loop followed by a stack of, infinite loop would be correct, I'd count that as correct. More exactly, we'd get a stack overflow exception because we'd get functions calling functions calling functions calling functions. If we had infinite stack size, it would run forever, but um, eventually the program can't keep track of all the function calls we're doing and it will just throw its, up, its hands up in the air and give up. That's what a stack overflow exception is. Okay, so this one is another one that's deliberately annoying. There's going to be, an, I guarantee you, there's going to be an easier 
but similar version of this question on the exam. Because it is, it is done, this question exists only to teach one thing, and that is that arguments are positional and the names, uh, the names are, don't, uh, are all made up and they don't matter. So, here's the first thing. X, Y, and Z have different values. X, Y, and Z have different values. So I'm just going to call this function fun. X, Y, and Z have different values. X's value is 6. Y is 8. Z is 4. Now when we call confundus, we pass in Z, Y, X means that the 4 goes here, sorry, zxy. 4 goes here, 6 goes here, 8 goes here. Okay. Now Confundus takes in a variable called y, a variable called x, and a variable called z. Now you might think that means that it's 8, 6, 4. It's not. Because what happens when we pass in parameters? is that we just care about the number, we care about what values are inside the variables and we copy them over. So here, 4 gets copied over to y, Eight, uh, sorry, 4 gets copied over, then 6, then 8. So let's go ahead and do this. 4, 6, 8 is now, is y, x, z inside of confundus. So these x's are different than this x, y, z. Now, th why is that? Because it'd be a pain in the butt if it wasn't. Because then you'd have to remember, wait, did I use this variable in some other function? Did the library I'm calling use this variable in some function? Right? So function, so variables inside functions or as parameters, they live only and exist only within that function and param only within that function. So z, y, so y, x, z. So the first step is to increment x. This value is x, so we're going to increment it from 6 to 7. The next value is y is equal to y minus x plus z. So it will be, so what we want to do is 4 minus 7 plus 8. 4 minus 7 is negative 3 plus 8 is 5. Then print out z, x, y, which would be 8, 7, 5, which is our answer. 8 space 7 space 5. So if that one's annoying, notice how I did that. I had no idea what the answer is. I didn't try to solve it in my head and go, oh, my answer is 875. How can you not see that? No, I'm like, what in the world am I doing again? Right, just say it with authority. They'll, they'll believe you. Um, so, no, what we do, what I did is I wrote down the variables and replaced them and updated them. I kept track of them. And then moved through them. All right, so each of these so you're going to have at least, I th so you're going to have just two straight up programming questions. Um, again, these were harder than, than normal, but they still use what hopefully you've known. Um, again, self-grading note, there's a three-point penalty if you have extra tailing space, uh, sp space and comma. Again, it's a fence post question, as I said. So write a function called each character, which returns a new string made by separating each character with a comma and a space. So this was worth 10 points. And so the idea here is that, again, whoops. Okay. Hello becomes H-E-L-L-O. Now there's a lot of different ways here 
to do this one. Um, so the first thing to note is that if it's just one letter, one string, right, then we don't need to make any changes to it. So uh, if len s equal equals 1, right, we don't need to make any changes to it, right, because there's nothing to separate from it. So I'll return uh, you can either return s, although more exactly you should return a copy of s, like that, right? Just copy it. No, so from the beginning, slice it from the beginning to the end without any changes, and that produces a new a new string because I specified a new string, but the, that's okay. Or if you wanted another way to to return a new string is just do empty string plus s, right? That'll predict, create a new string. The old your which is the empty string concatenate with the old string. There's a couple ways to do that. Um, now, again, there's a couple solutions here. I'm going to start with the more hacky solution, which is not what I intended, but uh, as a solution, and nor do I expect this from you. But it's kind of this idea of you can think about outside the box, and anything is fair game. Um, now, you may remember from my lectures that if I throw a string into a list like this, hello, we, got, we get this. And then if you remember the join function, we can use, we can say, I'd like to glue using a comma and a space everything in, in this list together. That's no dot join. And notice that, that will work. This is the hacky solution that I did not intend, but after writing this question and coming back to it a couple years later, I'm like, oh, that works. So that is the hacky solution, using join to glue stuff together like that. Split it up with list, join it together. Um, okay. So, but let's go for an, a bit of a non-hack, and that would just simply be over here, by the way. Um, return, boom, boom, which looks ugly, but it works. Dot join. A list. Turn the string into a list, right? And I would not expect this of you. I did not expect this of uh, uh, you guys at the moment. I'm showing it to you because. I'm trying to demonstrate. If you look up a function in Python and it exists, you can bring it to the exam and use it. Okay. But more realistically, what I expect you to do is to do is to create an accumulator. Out is equal to this. Return out, right? Out being our output. So, and then what we're going to do is, all right, let's go for the seven-point solution right now, right? The seven point solution is fairly straightforward, which is that if I have a trailing space, a comma space after the last letter, an extra comma space, then that's three points off. A lot of the questions I have are like that, where basically I say, this is full credit, this is half credit, or something like, or this is a penalty, right? Or I try to do that for some of these questions. So for I in, so for, for, uh, C in S. So for each character, we'll just go ahead and say for car in S. For each character in, in our in our string S, output out is equal to that char it, what we currently have in our out string, plus a comma and a space, and return out. And notice that what this will do, right, is that if I if I uh, print each character of hello, this will give us, oh, what did I forget? Car, out plus character plus space, right? Take what we already have, add the character, and then add a comma and space to it. This will give us H-E-L-L-O, and we'll have that extra comma and space afterwards, which is, again, 
more than we wanted. Um, but that's seven points, that's seven out of 10, that's not bad, right, at all. But now you're thinking, wait, hold on a second, here's my output. I am always gonna have too much in the way of a, uh, of a comma space. Always these two extra characters are gonna be reducing my score by three points. So why don't I just simply make the string and then remove those last two characters? That makes sense? So I can do out, go up to, but do not include, right? Slice the string like that. And this will just simply go, oh, I don't want those last two characters, right? Right, negative one is last character, negative two is second to last character. So go up to, but don't include the second to last character. So the slice notation is. But maybe you don't want the slice notation or you forget how to do it or it's inelegant. By the way, I will remind you how to do the slice notation in the back of the, of the first sheet, by the way. So I do have that. So even if you forget that on your cheat sheet, it's on the back of the exam or it's on the back of the front page of the exam. So, what else can I do, do there? Well, it requires a bit more, but we can go up to, what we can do is simply we can say for index in, F, in range length of S, what we can do is that we can say go up to, so what this does is that if, if, um, is if the word is five characters long, this loop will run four times. It'll run over zero, indices zero through three. It will do everything but the last index. So we'll say character is equal to S at index. And then we take that our current output, add the character it, and add a comma to it. Now notice that that's not that we're not really done yet. Oops, done, none. Oh right, return out. Notice that we're not done. We just get hell, which is not a great place to be. Oh, that was funny. So the um, for so now we're at the last. So now though we have just the last character to add to out, right? We've got everything though, but the last character. We've got H E L L comma space, right? So we need, and so we need that last character. So let's add that last character in. Can't just add O because uh, if I was going to do one, if I was going to do hello like that, I'd get. No, I need the literal last character, which, again, we're just going to use that negative notation there to get the last character. So add everything but the last character with a comp, you know, for each character except for the last character. Add, a, add the character with a, with a comma and a space to it, to the output. And then add in the last character at the last in minute. So there's a lot of different ways to do this one, as you can see. As long as they work, not really too picky about them. And even if you couldn't get it to work all the way, it's still seven points out of 10, which is great. So write a new function called sum of threes that will return the first, the sum of the first n positive integers that are divisible by three. If n is less than or equal to zero, return zero. So that sounds like an easy way to get a point or two for the first, for the first one. Um, which is uh, def sum of threes n. So if n is greater than or equal to zero, return zero. Okay, that's gotta be worth a point or something, right? Next, well we wanna just print out these three, well we wanna return these numbers, so we wanna accumulate again. So uh, total, is equal to zero, zero, return total. Now I'm not using the term sum because if you notice when I type sum, it comes up like it's a keyword. That's because sum is a keyword. It's a function that you can use to add things, to get to add lists 
uh, all the items in a list together. So it's very useful. Uh, so total is equal to zero. So we want all the multiples of three. We want the first n multiples of three. So if we put in three, we want three, six, nine. If we put in five, we want three, six, nine, five, sorry, three, six, nine, four, oh, sorry, 12, 15. So actually what we notice is that this is actually one times three, two times three, and three times three. This is one times three, two times three, three times three, four times three, five times three. So actually, there's a number of ways to do this one as well, but one very intuitive way is, since it's just the sum of multiples of three, for, uh, for multiple in range one, two, n plus one, up to and including n, for so one up to and including n, that's what, what, how you do it inclusively like that. Total is equal to total plus multiple, multiple times three. So sum of threes five. So that gives us 45, which is the expected result. Again, there's a number of ways to do this one. This one's considerably easier and much more like the difficulty you might actually get on the exam. All right. Last questions. Write, the pro uh, write a t program that uses a turtle to draw a spiral, right? What kind of spiral? Does it need to be triangular or square or pentagram? No, I don't care. It's got to be spirally. Sorry? Yeah, got to go around. So in other words, we need to add our distance. So I'm going to go ahead and import turtle. You can do that anywhere. Um, but again, I'm just going to do that at the top. And for these questions, you can totally assume that turtle has been imported. OK? You can't assume that Bob has been created, but you can assume turtle has been imported. Bob is equal to uh, turtle dot turtle. Actually, let me go ahead and say death spiral. Bob is equal to a tur is equal to our new turtle. Actually, Bob's got a lot of limelight. I'm going to say Alice is equal to a turtle. Okay, so we're going to tell Alice to create a spiral. Okay, and what she needs to do is we just got to say for x in range. Let's go, or let's say, let's go for step in range 50. Let's go with 1 to, one to 50. So that will go total 49 times. We'll tell Alice to move forward. A hundred steps. And then Alice dot right uh, 90. Now that would just draw a square a whole bunch of times. What makes it a spiral is when we go a bit further each time before each time we turn. So here we're going to say forward maybe step times 20. It's not going to do anything and then I'm going to say uh, turtle dot so what I'm going to say over here is call spiral all I care about is basically this code. I put in a function just simply because it was easy for here. All I care about is this code, by the way, over here. So spiral is equal to, so call spiral, and then I'm going to, this code doesn't matter either, turtle dot done. And, but you can see I'm making a spiral now. Or rather, Alice is making this spiral. I'm just basically taking credit for all of Alice's hard work. So yeah, that's how you make a spiral. It doesn't really matter um, how, uh, how, what, what, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, this kind of spiral or whether you're doing 
this kind of spiral, right? I'm, I'm really, we're not really that uh, attached to it. We just want to know that basic concept. Draw the result of this turtle program below. You can use a dot to represent the stamp. Um, we've already done that. We've done this one in class numerous times, right? So I'm going to, so please forgive me if I don't go over it again, um, because we've done this one numerous times. In fact, we did it last lecture, or something similar to this fact last lecture. And if I've done it that many times, then maybe that should give you a hint that something like this is definitely going to be on the exam. Um, all right, so there's one over here that's interesting, um, where I just simply say extra practice, problem oil or problem one. That's Euler, by the way, because names are weird. Um, so Project Euler problem one, first off, Project Euler is a bunch of math problems that are, require a computer to solve. Um, so let's go ahead and check out Project Euler for a second. So Project Euler, again, you, it's a question, these problems you can solve. Project Euler problem one, Basically, if you can do that, you've got the basics of, of all the mechanics of, a progr of, of programming language down, or the basic mechanics of it. So when you're learning a new programming language, if you can do Project Euler, you means you've got a handle of at least the basic syntax. So if we list all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of 3 or 5, we get 3, 5, 6, and 9. Right? Those are all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of 3 or 5. Natural numbers, they're your counting numbers. They're positive integers. Multiples of 3 or 5, 3, 5, 6, and 9. That's an or, not an and. The sum of these multiples is 23, right? 5 plus 3 plus 5 plus 6 plus 9 is 23. That's, so that's the sum of all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of 3 or 5. Find the sum of all multiples of 3 or 5 below 1,000 which is a bit much, right? It's a lot of, that's a lot to do by hand, but computers are great. So we're going so to solve that right now. All the multiples of 3 or 5 that are below 1,000. So um, def Euler 1. We're going to do this as simple, no tricks here. Uh, total is equal to 0. Return total. We want all the numbers below a thousand, right? That are multiples of three or five. So four I uh, so four num in range from zero. Well actually we'll start from one. But it doesn't really matter where we start. Eh. Well you can just go up to a thousand. For all the numbers that are less than a thousand. If num mod 3 equal equals 0. So if the number is divisible by 3, or num is divisible by 5, then that number is divisible by 3 or 5, so we should add it to our, to our total, plus equals number. Then return the total. It's a lot of math there that goes on, but hey, run it. Oh, right, I should totally print that value. Print that subprogram, and we get 233,168, which I know from having done this a lot of times is actually the answer. Um, so there's a number of additional practice problems here. Um, write a method that return, takes an integer and returns how many digits it has. That's a useful one. Um, let's see another good one. These are a lot of practice questions uh, that I put out there. Write a method that prints out the first n Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers are numbers that are the are each Fibonacci the nth Fibonacci number is equal to the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. So the sequence is one one two three five eight. 8 plus, sorry, 5 plus 8 is equal to 13. 8 plus 13 is equal to 21. That's the next number in there. Then 21 plus 13 is equal to 34, which is the next number in there. So print out the n first Fibonacci numbers. 
All right. Um, one other resource for you guys before I dismiss you, since you guys probably are asking where else to go for practice, uh, codingbat.com as a no, as a section for Python programs. I would go and check that out. Um, yeah.